Hello. Welcome to Wednesday's Word of Encouragement from Calvary Assembly of God. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Pastor Ray Richards. I pastor here at Calvary Assembly. And for the last few weeks, we've had my wife with us, but tonight we have a special guest. This is Peter Harrison. Uh, Peter and I have been friends for a long time, uh, probably close to 30 years now. And I've invited him to join us for tonight's broadcast instead. Um, next week, we'll resume our series on spiritual disciplines. Uh, but tonight, I want to speak with Peter on a couple of issues. Uh, the first one has to deal with COVID-19. Uh, our church this Sunday coming up is going to host a drive-in worship service in our church parking lot at 10 a.m. We're finally able to regather together, and we're looking forward to it, a celebration of the family of God. But as we come together, I know there's going to be a temptation. We're going to want to, uh, to, want to shake hands, give hugs, and all of that, and not want to social distance. And especially here in Schoharie County, because our numbers have been so much lower with COVID-19, I think we're in the, the bottom two or three counties in the entire state in terms of the number of deaths. We've had one, maybe two. We've only had about 50 diagnosed cases. But Peter, uh, he lives up here, but he also has a home down in the city. And it's been a totally different story. And so I thought it would be helpful to have Peter join tonight to share with us some of the things that he's seen and experienced with the COVID so that we don't take it lightly. We don't want to walk in fear. We want to walk in faith. Amen. But we don't want to walk in presumption or foolishness. We want to walk in wisdom, especially in our country as it's opening up. We're hearing about some outbreaks down in the Southwest, also in California. Uh, I talked to my good friend, uh, Greg Riss, shared with me a church in Texas. They lost two priests to COVID-19. So we want to be wise here. And so, Pete, would you just share a little bit of what you've personally experienced as well as the church and some of the things down there in the city? Well, it's not enough time. <laughs> uh, just but. so you know, we may be going a little bit longer tonight. It's probably going to be a little bit more than 15 minutes, closer to 30. So just letting you know that ahead of time. My, the first words that come to my mind, the first word is nightmare. Okay. It was like a nightmare. It was like being in a cauldron that was being stirred. Um, sirens constantly, sirens constantly, and you knew what the sirens were. Wow. And then you would find out the next day or a few days later, so-and-so died, so-and-so died. This person is sick this person is sick it made me feel I, I don't I, I'm gonna try not to jump around too much but a lot of strong feelings can come to my mind it made me feel like we were living in a third world country where you hear about bombings and somebody lost half of their family in one shot that's what it was like I said this is what it feels like to be in a third world in situation where people are dying due to famine Mm -hmm. war or disease that's what it honestly felt like and it made me very sympathetic to my brothers and sisters actually um, um, overseas actually okay. um, I found that my wife every time she heard a siren she would come out and talk to me it's bothering me the sirens bother me I guess like a dog hearing mm -hmm. a high whistle that would bother him she would constantly say, it's bothering me. The sirens didn't bother me that much. Getting all the reports, one after another after another, it got to the point where when somebody called me or somebody would call my wife, she'd say, Peter, sit down. Wow. And I'd go, oh, no, now what? It almost became a bizarre joke. She called me, I'd say, okay, who now? Wow. You know, That can really play with your head after a while. Because it's almost very surreal. You kind of don't, you feel like you're going to wake up from it. Okay, okay. I'm going to wake up okay. and it's going to be a bad dream. I'm going to tell people, so-and-so died, so-and-so died. This person got sick, this person got sick, this person's in the hospital, rest, rest, blah, 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 blah. and you just don't wake up from it, you know. Wow. So that's, those are my initial okay. feelings. It was just like a nightmare. And right now, even thinking back, because the worst of it is over, um, I had somebody pass away a week and a half ago. Uh, about two weeks ago, but they were coming way more than a week uh, a week apart. Uh, right, they were, they were right, coming way. Right. So to have somebody, it's almost good news that the last person passed away about a week and a half, two weeks ago. I can't believe I'm saying that's good news, yeah. but relatively speaking, it's a bit of a relief. You get a chance to recover 
from one person passing away before you have to react react to the next one. My next funeral is a week from tomorrow downstate. That's the next funeral. The person passed away about a week ago, but the churches and the funeral homes are really backed up. Not as much as they were back in March and April, but they're really backed up. So to get a time in a church is is not the easiest thing. Wow. And you personally, you and I were talking, you had some family and even yourself uh, probably had the COVID-19 as well. Right, right. And, um, and you shared with me also about someone you led to the Lord in January and you went through that heartache. Okay, I hope I get to this one. Um, elderly gentleman, uh, on the very first Sunday of this year, okay. I led him to the Lord. And he made it clear. I, I knew his wife and his daughter. They were very dear to me, very dear to me. Um, she was a baker, the daughter. She always make, I have pictures of her cakes on my wall up here, actually. I, whenever there was a special occasion, she's one of the places I would go to to get cakes. So it's nice, rich carrot cakes. Anyway, he told me on the first Sunday of the year that he wanted to make sure everything was straight with the Lord. Okay. And from now on, I'm giving my all to God. And if you had said to me, that within four months, three and a half, four months, he wouldn't be here. On the one hand, that's very sad, obviously. On the other hand, it is, um, it's, it's kind of not fulfilling, but it's something which is very encouraging. I know where he's at. Amen. I know the decision he made, and I feel like I was, I was part of God's plan. So anyway, his name was Goldburn um, Cumberbatch. I led him to the Lord on that Sunday, which was about the 5th or whatever of January. He accepted the Lord enthusiastically. He was easy to witness to. Wish, you wish it were all that easy. He was ready. <laughs> Things didn't start breaking out and closing up and started getting serious in February and then definitely in around the end of March. Um, his wife went into the hospital. His daughter, Marcia, went into the hospital. They were both in the hospital at the same time. One died. They were hoping the other one was, the wife was starting to look good actually. She died about a week and a half way later. So he put his wife and his daughter in the ground. And then two weeks later, he died. Wow. Now they said he didn't have corona. He had a heart attack. Okay. It was clearly corona related. You know, everybody said he died of a broken heart. Um, he was a, a full of life gentleman. Um, I'm confident, I don't know for a fact, I'm confident if he had not just put his wife and his daughter in the ground, he wouldn't have suffered a heart attack from stress and he, yeah. he'd still be here. But So that's the situation. I have this, um, I showed it to you. This is my, on my phone, my Corona, Corona folder. It's all the people who have passed away. Not just the ones who have been sick now, seriously sick. But all the ones who have passed away, and there's two pictures I'm still waiting on that aren't on this folder yet. Everybody, one of my friends, he lost his aunt, his uncle, his brother, and his father in like a three to four week span. It just ravaged his family. I didn't know all the people in his family. I just met his brother. So that didn't touch me as, as much as with Goldburn, who family I knew for years right. and decades. Yeah. Wow. So as we're looking at opening up, as I said, there's going to be a temptation to want to get close, want to right. touch. I know we're not the same condition, New York City, right. Scoharry, but this isn't a joke, is it? To say it's not a joke is putting it mildly. Too many times we look at things through the lens of our experience. Yeah. It's natural. I do it, you know, we kind of all do it. It's hard to step out of our own experience and look at it like a, th a second party. Um, this is absolutely not a joke. It is absolutely serious. Just because one area of the country or of the state is not dealing with it as seriously, doesn't have as many cases, which, which I can understand not being as alert, maybe, because you don't, you don't have the sirens all around. You're not always hearing of somebody passing away. You're not losing a pastor, um, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it is very serious. And your brothers and sisters, I'm assuming most of the people watching this are part of the body of Christ. 
Many people in the body of Christ are suffering greatly. Their lives have been ravaged. And some people, it's happened so quickly, so suddenly, they don't totally get it yet. They're still reacting. Okay. Like, what, what just happened last month mm -hmm. to, my, to my loved ones? This is something that people, some men will need therapy and help over to deal with. So it absolutely is not a joke. People should absolutely take it seriously because if it takes, if, if, if one person gets it, what happens most of the time is that you can spread it and not know it. Right. And you think you're fine and everything, then by the time you start showing symptoms, you have spread it possibly to other individuals. No one's going to be around somebody who's <coughs> got a fever. It's when you're feeling fine. You feel safe being around people and other people feel safe being around you. Okay. Part of the, I think, the challenge that I'm facing as a pastor and other pastors in our community and even across the state and the nation is it seems like sometimes the rules change. You know, we're told, don't wear the mask. It's not necessary. Right. Then we're told, you better wear the mask. Right. Then we're told not to wear the mask. Right. We're told asymptomatic people can't give it. Then we're told they can't. So it, it feels like we're stepping on quicksand. No doubt. It, it, or the rug's being pulled out. And so we're trying to implement protocols here. Uh, the outdoor service will be different, obviously, than inside. Uh, people will have their cars. They'll be able to be in a chair near their car. But we're going to ask people to honor the social distancing. We're going to ask them to wear masks if they can't be within that certain amount. We're going to have the parking lot set up mm -hmm. so there's enough spaces between cars. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm asking those who are watching that will be coming to the service, we ask you to please honor this. You may not agree, all right? But here's the point. If you're wrong, somebody could die. If I'm wrong, we're inconvenienced. To me as a pastor responsible for the whole flock of God, I've got to watch out for those in our church that are vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable in terms of population. So I'm going to ask you please to honor these requests. We're going to do the best we can. We're listening to counsel we're getting from our district superintendent, mm -hmm. from the legal counsel of the Assemblies of God. One of the things we received recently from the Assemblies of God legal department is that if you push beyond what the limits are and what the requirements are in the emergency, uh, you could be held liable for that. Wow. So we want to be good stewards. We want to have a, a good witness. One of the things that Brother Durst said yesterday on our conference call is that if you push too fast and you're the one that starts the spike, whatever positive you gather from being together will be outweighed by the negative Amen. of what happened. Amen. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to make people safe. Um, we're going to send out an email to everybody that's coming. Um, it's going to announce in terms of using the bathroom, be one at a time. We're going to have a little sanitary wipe there that you, we're going to ask you to, to wipe down the, uh, the handles and the faucets when you're there. Um, there's just some of these little precautions. Now, someone might argue, well, you know, I don't want to do this. They, you know, they shouldn't have to do this. There's a, a great story where Jesus and Peter are having a discussion. Peter's been asked by the Pharisees, does your master pay the tax? Right. And uh, Peter comes to Jesus, and Jesus starts this conversation with him. And he goes, well, we really don't need to. Mm -hmm. However, lest we offend, offend them, them, here's yes. what I want you to do. I want to be a good witness to our community. I want to glorify God, and I want to love my neighbor. And those are those three points that we're trying to use to develop the protocol. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you sharing about that. I think having a different perspective from somebody who's actually been in the trenches. I know you said your family, number of members had it. Absolutely. You all were at a funeral. Yeah. You know, you had it. They just... You know, you're going to be tested for the antibodies. And so it isn't a joke. It isn't a game. And we just want to make sure we're being wise. Amen. And you know something? Maybe using the word submissive is wrong, but bending towards what the law says is, I understand people's ambivalence towards government. I, I, I have a healthy caution, <laughs> caution regarding government regulations and so on and so forth. But I want to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, because I have a problem with A and B, I'm going to reject C and D. No, I really do think that this is really wise what you're doing. You know, you're not asking, you're, we're not bending over backwards. We're taking good faith, necessary, I think to a certain degree, easy right. precautions. And I don't want people to reject it because they're symbolically rejecting C and D. Right because they have a problem with A and B. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. So the plan is, at least for the next couple of weeks, we're going to do the drive-in services, just a chance for the body to come together and gather. Um, and then we're going to look at, the, the, what we're hearing is 25% now in phase two, 
-hmm. So that would mean we'd start two services inside the last Sunday of June. So that's kind of where we're heading. We may see if the numbers change or whatever. But thank you on that. But what I'd like to do, let me just take a quick peek here. Yeah, we got time. What I'd like to do is address another issue that our country has, and that's dealing with racism. You and I both attended Saturday's Peace Vigil over at Doc Riley Park. Uh, when I was asked to take part, I, I said that I certainly can do that, but I think it would be more powerful if you and I could do it together. And I'm so thankful that you were there. Um, the story is in the Times Journal uh, today, so people can, can see that. Um, but what I want to address with you, as a pastor, as a pastor who is, who is white, part of the majority culture, pastors of church is predominantly white, what can we as Christians and what can we as a church do to help biblically, prophetically, and redemptively speak life, hope, and the gospel into the situation? Well, the two things, I mean, there's, there's a number of them, but the two things which I tend to emphasize, particularly in limited time, and which I brought out on Saturday, is to humbly try and see where others are coming from. Even though they may be saying what they're saying in somewhat of an abrasive way, they may turn you off, they may be affiliated or at least for a particular situation, linking arms with people who you may have a problem with. Still, one should be trying to humbly say, let me listen to what they're saying. I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. If you're married, your spouse knows you don't know everything. If you're honest with yourself, you know you don't know everything. You may feel emboldened in what you believe because everybody you're around believes it doesn't make it correct. Even if what I believe is correct, I want to humbly, again, as I said earlier, not just um, before we started, not just let you talk so I can then give you the correct view. Right. Okay, you talk for 10 minutes, now let me tell you how it really <laughs> is. Here. No, maybe, maybe what I'm saying is not totally the way it really is. Maybe partly it is. I find that oftentimes it's it's not either or right, black and white. Right. It's oftentimes some shades of gray in there. You know, you may have some bits. I may have some bits, and we need to come together. But either way, to listen humbly. One of the examples I gave was when you see a black person that's been, first of all, to not just assume that they're just whining. Just get over it. Mm -hmm. They're always saying that. It should be lucky more didn't happen. People who say that haven't been through situations or maybe don't know people who have been through situations and as I said on Saturday one of the things that would be helpful is to for one to wrestle with themselves look at the police officers knee on the neck of George Floyd or any other situation and try and make believe for a moment and visualize that is my relative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what breaks my heart about George Floyd and others, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Ar Arbery and um, Mr. Castillo, when it, what breaks my heart is that when I look at them, I see my relative. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, didn't know per I, I didn't personally know any of them. Right. But I see my relative. I see my cousin. And it breaks my heart. And I see myself. One thing I shared, which I won't go into now, is a situation. I've had s several situations downstate, mm -hmm. but I had one up here, which was a totally bogus situation, but the wheels of law enforcement were turning and unleashed on me to deal with the situation because somebody made a complaint that I was stalking them or I was private investigating them. And so they came into Walmart and they pulled me away from talking with somebody so they could then question me. Turns out they were outside waiting for me actually but got couldn't wait any longer so they came into the store. One of the most humiliating days of my life actually. I remember we talked about it. Yep. So it is good to understand other people's perspective, perspective even if you don't wind up totally agreeing with it. Oftentimes you're going to find that they do have some points in their perspective actually. Try not to assume that because I have always felt this way and everybody I know feel this way and my parents feel this way and the neighborhood feel that, 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 try to say, you know what, let me humbly listen to the other side and maybe just because everybody else feels this way in my bubble, maybe it's not 100% correct. The second thing that I would say, so that's trying to be, to have empathy. 
um, and a broader understanding. The second thing, which is very disappointing to many people in suburbs and cities, is the quietness of the evangelical church. Oftentimes, blacks, and myself to a certain degree, but blacks who have gone through things, look at the evangelical church and being a conservative Republican as one and the same. I personally am here to represent as best I can the body of Christ. I don't always do that. But my goal, I don't want anyone to look at me and go, oh, you're a, you're a, you're a black liberal progressive Christian. Or you're a, a conservative Republican Christian. I want to say, no, I'm doing my best. Because I personally don't think, I think some people would be surprised if they think always Jesus is on their side and if he were here on every issue. I think people go, Really, Jesus? <laughs> We've banked our whole philosophy on having God on our side, you know? I, I think people would be surprised, actually. But to try, I, I want people to know I'm doing my best to represent Jesus. Even if I don't always do that, I want people to look at me and go, when Pete speaks, I want to listen to Pete. Because Pete is doing his best to not be holding to any philosophy or party or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But to objectively and as independently as I can to say, Lord, help me through your word and your spirit to view this the way you, have, you, you, you would view it. There used to be the expression, the bracelet, what would Jesus do? Sometimes something that has a, that is set a lock and become a cliche. Most cliches have a really solid, powerful well, beginning. Yeah, that's true. And they turn into cliches because they're just kind of said flippantly. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus view it? So whether you're talking about whatever hot button issue that you want to talk about, whether it's racism, um, people at the border trying to come in, wh whatever it is, whatever it is. I, I don't want to get in trouble naming hot button issues, you know. But whatever the hot button issue is where people tend to like really square off and draw the line and, 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 and I'm not crossing over there and you better not cross over here or I'll chew you up. I think we need to really do our best to see where the Lord might be, even if we don't agree, to go back to the first thing I said, to try and see it from the other person's perspective humbly. It is so powerful for me to know you're listening. And again, not just listening so you can share your view, but really, really trying to listen, even if we don't agree at the end, totally, to know that you think enough of me that you're humbling yourself enough before me to go, I'm going to really listen, really listen to you. Right. Those are a couple of things that I think can go a long way. We have really felt that the white evangelical church has not cried out as much. And I tell you something, this is going to be strong. This is going to be, this is going to maybe rattle some people. I don't know. Um, the, the, the white evangelical church, I think, I say this humbly, would have a much more powerful ally in much of the black church if they stood with us on certain issues over the decades. Yeah, well, do you remember Saturday, one of the things I mentioned is what would have happened in our country right. if following the Second Great Awakening, when God's Spirit was working all over the place, church after church after church, if the church with one voice, one voice. north and south, black and white, with one voice had said no to slavery. What would happen? Because the, the, the world, the, the country was listening to the church. Mm -hmm. It was powerful. They, they were having, in Rochester, New York, where I'm from, when Finney came through there, it was such a powerful outpouring that criminals weren't committing crimes. Right. The jailers had nothing to do. Right. You know, they, they, were, they really believed that God called them not just to have a heavenly experience but a heavenly experience with earthly results amen. amen they they what would have happened though if it hadn't been a divided church what if it hadn't been a quiet church what if the church had stood together cross denominationally cross ethnically cross color and said this is what heaven looks like in terms of where we're living and we're saying no this is sin this is wrong amen. what would have been the history of what our country would have been the history that's right 
That's right. Think about that in terms of no Jim Crow laws, right. no separate but equal. Right. None of this. What would happen? And, and 10 years ago, our community went through an experience right. with racism. Yeah. And I personally have had to step out and stand against racism when I've seen it in the schools as a substitute teacher or things that I've witnessed at, at events I've attended. But the church in Square County 10 years ago stood together and said, not on our watch. And here we are 10 years ago, 10 years later, and we're still battling racism in our county. But I'm thrilled that there were many churches that were represented yeah, there right. on Saturday. Mm -hmm. You know, and what we're saying is no, we want to stand together, not because to me it's not a Republican conservative issue, it's not a progressive conservative issue, it's it's not a Republican Democrat conservative progressive. It it is a biblical issue mm -hmm. of righteousness and justice and truth and grace. Of one blood, God made all people. Mm -hmm. That means you and I are connected. Amen. You know, this idea Amen. of a hierarchy was false and established just 500 years ago. Amen. So my heart is, is that I stand against racism because God created humanity in his image and mm -hmm. in his likeness in all of the diversity of color. Amen. And that before the throne, there's going to be representatives of every tribe, every yeah, language, every, every nation, every, every, every nation. people. That's right. Amen. And I think church ought to be a taste a of heaven. Taste of that on earth. Amen. And I know you and I have forged a friendship over the years and I value our friendship. You've mm -hmm. been a blessing to me. Sister Effie, I mentioned her Saturday. She's been a blessing in her life and her late husband, Ralph Poe. And so my heart, even though it's just been a very short conversation, just, you know, 15, 20 minutes about this, I hope that we are able to make an impact and not just be silent Amen. and not just say, it's not my problem. It's their problem. The danger is when we separate into they, us and them, they. If we truly believe that scripturally we are the humanity God created, and if we believe certainly as the body of Christ we are connected mm -hmm. as brothers and sisters in Christ, then the scripture says when one hurts, we all hurt. Amen. And so to me there is that biblical responsibility as the minor prophets talk about justice and they talk about righteousness, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Now, I know we got just a couple minutes left. Sometimes, Peter, I hear the statement, you know, when someone says black lives matter, someone will argue all lives matter. And you and I talked a little bit about that. I agree that all lives matter. I use the analogy that, and I saw this, and I think it's powerful. If you're in a neighborhood and you have 100 homes, to say that all homes matter is great, but if one of them was on fire, you say, let's get the fire out. Right. Any thoughts that you have on that? I'll give you the one I gave earlier regarding the coronavirus when people talk about opening up and this is not to say again one issue is one side is right or one side is wrong it's an endeavoring to be sensitive right. to the other side when people say let's open up and we should have never closed down the economy yes people will die yes people will a lot of people will get sick but we can't close down the economy and we'll get herd immunity and in the end, that'll be a good thing. We'll go through the fire and the pain, but in the end, we'll have our economy and we'll come back stronger, and that's just the price. And again, that is a legitimate discussion to have. People way smarter than me on both sides discuss that. So I'm not saying that's not a discussion to have. But what oftentimes black people and minorities hear when you say open up the economy, since we're only about 12, 13 percent of the U.S. population, roughly between 12 and 14 percent. But so far, around 30 percent of the deaths. What I hear is that you're willing to sacrifice more of my black brothers and sisters. So you're saying 30 percent of people of color are the ones that have passed away? That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And even though we're only like 12 to 40 percent of the U.S. Well, population, much higher, much higher rate. Yeah. So when you say, yeah, open up the economy, people are going to die, but we have to pay that price. Much more of people who look like me are going to be paying that price. Gotcha. And what that says without exactly coming out and just saying it is that at least the way people are going to hear you see, I'm trying to be very, very careful here. The way many people are going to hear that is that you're saying our lives don't matter as much because more of us are going to die to salvage or save that economy. And the cry from people who hear it that way, they say, hold it, no, no. Black lives matter. 
And as I brought out earlier, there's an organization Black Lives Matter, but the sentiment and the philosophy of Black Lives Matter predates the organization. When many people say Black Lives Matter, they're not thumbs upping or thumbs downing necessarily the organization. They're just saying Black Lives Matter, not more than white lives, not more than blue lives, not more than red lives. They matter as much and equally along with everybody else's lives. That's one example where people have a want to uh, enact a policy or have a philosophy or things and don't really realize, not because they're overt racist necessarily, but don't really realize that in a subtle way it's, it's, it's feeding into what we perceive as a racist view, a view that, bat that values one group over the other group. And hence we say black lives matter. Gotcha. We could go on for a while. We could, yeah. Because yeah, you and I yeah. are talkers. Right. We go to Walmart, and three hours later, our wives are wondering <laughs> where we are because we're jabbing away. So I just want to say thank you for mm -hmm. your willingness to hang around up here a little bit longer, to stay here. I'm thankful you and I were able to do that on Saturday. Would you do the honor and close us off in prayer? Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time. And I pray, Lord, for a spirit of humility. God, you are opposed to the proud. You give grace to the humble. And most of us can use more grace, my God. I want to avail myself to your grace. So I want to humble myself to listen to other views, to try and understand other views, to not just belong to one party or the other party, one philosophy or the other philosophy, Lord, but to do our best, maybe not perfect all the time, but to do what Jesus would do. See it the way Jesus would say it. Act towards it the way Jesus would act towards it, God. May we be, help us to step out of our comfort zones, Lord God, that we have lived in, that we have erected around us, Lord Jesus, to try, God, to glorify your name and progress on the area, in the area of racism, Lord, and understanding our brothers and sisters on both sides, God, in the name of Jesus, Father. Amen. Amen. So just a reminder, on Sunday, it's the drive-in service. Everybody is welcome to come. We're going to again ask you, please come in the east entrance. That's the one closest to Route 145. Parking attendants will guide you to your spot. Um, we're going to ask you, if you could, to start coming by 940. Uh, this will give us plenty of time to get everyone set so we can start at 10. We recognize that not everyone is going to come, so we are still planning on live streaming the service. So you'll be able to catch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, at uh, Just type in YouTube.com and then go to Cobleskill Calvary Assembly, and you'll be able to find us live streamed at 10 a.m. We are looking forward to a family celebration. Keep praying for nice weather. Uh, we're Amen. hoping for good weather. It looks okay. Uh, it keeps changing, but I think we're going to be okay. Uh, we're looking forward to a great time. But thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Peter, and go in the grace of our God.